So you've seen a lot. Have you ever looked at the trends that come and go where people have decided to jump on that? Have you ever been tempted? No, 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 because what we represented was never really about, look, we wanted to make money and we were gonna make money, yeah. right? So there was never a need to clown ourselves right. in order to do that. But I don't knock anyone on the decisions they make because they're the ones that have to live with themselves. We could have gotten more exposure, but at the cost of compromise. There are not a lot of UGK music videos. In, in my mind, UGK's first real music video is an international player scene. What up, what up, what up? Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, want to welcome you to another edition of your favorite podcast, the Charles Coleman Podcast. I'm Charles Coleman, here to welcome you to a very special episode. Man, this is a good one. We got lined up. I'm trying to tell you. We got a special guest. We got a good conversation. So we're going to get right into it. But the first thing we got is one of my favorite contributors, Mr. Style and Performance. DJ CEO on the lean is in the building, ladies and gentlemen. What's happening? What's, What's happening? happening? What's, What's up, up, bro? Good to see Chilling, you, man. man. Good How's to everything? be here. Good, man. Good. I'm excited. Yeah. Happy spring. <laughs> spring is sprung. It's, you know, it's doing what it's doing. Yeah. Uh, what made you start like even getting into it? the greenery? The greenery. Um, Vegas, really. You know, coming up, I was an athlete. It just wasn't something I did. Right. And I, then, I, I was an athlete too. I was there with you. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> oh, I'm doing that. All right. Okay. But no, but I just, it wasn't a thing. And then even after college and I came home, it was just not something I was like, I'm going to do. But when I moved out to Vegas, you know, dispensaries are like on every corner. It's like yeah. the bodegas. Yeah. Uh, and so it just became kind of a part of the lifestyle. And then COVID completely COVID turned me it. into like <laughs> weed. COVID did it. Yeah. COVID really, me and the wife. You'd be blaming COVID. <laughs> Yo, all 2020, all we did was like watch Netflix and <laughs> smoke weed. And smoke weed. <laughs> That's it. It was like a bad movie script. <laughs> it was amazing. COVID made me do we it. We had a great time. I'm, I'm sure it was. We had a great time. I, I, I'm sure it was, bro. I'm not knocking your hustle. <laughs> Listen, we're going to get right into our shortcuts. Uh, these are our news and views, comments and conversations on things that are affecting the culture, even though you may not have heard of them, but still have relevance to what we got going on in community. So first, we're going to start off with something like we're going to do our usual One Gotta Go. Yep. This is a new edition of One Gotta Go. It's for my nerds out here. So I want to do the superhero edition. We've got... Bruce Wayne, a.k.a. Batman. Okay. Peter Parker, a.k.a. Spider-Man. We've got Clark Kent, who is Superman. Mm -hmm. We're going to round it out with Tony Starks, who is Iron Man. Okay. One's got to go. It would probably be Tony Starks. Really? Yeah. Getting Tony off the couch. Yes. And why? This, and this is why. From a, a hip-hop cultural standpoint, like, Batman is our guy. Like... And if you really think about hip hop, like in the early 90s, like Batman was very much a part of the culture. Like people with the t-shirts, the like not too many okay, people. Okay, so I'll give you that. You know I'll what I mean? Like the, only reason, the argument that I would give is what Ghostface <clears throat> did for Iron Man 100%, and Tony Stark. So but that's that was, like the thing. But that's what Ghostface did for Tony Stark. I think hip hop Batman, in general embraced like Batman. Well, because he had the movie. Because he had the, exactly. Yeah, so that's, that's what I'm saying. I get it. Like, so with Bruce Wayne, like, I feel he came from like a pure sp space in the sense that I need to do, I need to do this. Something bad happened to my parents. I don't want this to happen to take over my city. So I'm going to do this. I think Tony Starks was more of like, I got money. There was a sense of like arrogance in the, in the elitist thing to it. And it's, I can do this because I'm rich and I'm wealthy. And it's like to be a superhero or somebody who's caping for the city or caping for the world, yeah. like his approach to it seemed very self uh Self-motivated? Self-motivated. As opposed to like, you know, I feel like, especially when you look at actual superheroes like a Spider-Man or Superman, it's like, yo, I have this gift. I have to do something to get back. So that's why I would get rid of Tony Starks. So it's very interesting you make that argument. Uh, for me, Batman's got to go. He's okay. out of here. Okay. I think Batman is overrated. <laughs> I think Batman is overrated. I'll say it again. I think Batman is overrated. I think that like... First of all, you know, they're very interesting characters to parallel in terms of Batman and Iron Man because neither of them has actual superpowers. superpowers right. right. So like this They're Batman, both just wealthy. They're both just mad rich and yeah. make amazing toys. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> right. I the, the right. thing about Batman, like to me, I think he's overrated in a universe where like they tried to put him on par with like some really like special crazy individuals. Agreed. And I'm kind of like, 
So you mean to tell me <laughs> in, a, you, in, in a room where you got Aquaman, Superman, right. Wonder Woman, Flash. I felt the same way about the movie, about the Batman versus Superman. Like, I was like, this is Batman, really a versus? Is this like, is not even a contest, my guy. So I just feel like there's been generations where this man has been super overrated. And I get kind of tired of like the brooding element of him. Like the reason why I actually like Tony Stark's mm-hmm. is... He's a billionaire. What's he brooding about? He has a good time. He messes with models. Like, that's what he this does. This is true. <laughs> like, he lives a much more realistic life. I he mean, does, I granted, right. you know, Bruce Wayne, he loses his parents. It's a tragic, you know, tragic uh, situation, crime. I get it. Mm-hmm. But it's just like, yo, dude, get off it. You got more money than, like, everybody. Enjoy your life. I get bro. it, but he's so still, party. but he, but because of that story, he has to be, he is, that's what makes him who he is. Like he's, he's compelled. He feels like he's called to like try to make the world a better place yeah. because of what happened. He's like, I mean. So rated. Yeah. Yeah, it's so rated. <laughs> anyway, drop it in the comments. Let us know what you think. Who would you get rid of? One's got to go superhero edition. That's going to lead us to our second shortcut. Um. Speaking of superheroes, supervillains, people in the superhero world, Jonathan Majors. Yeah. He is currently in a career spiral after the situation that occurred with him and his girlfriend, ex-girlfriend. I don't know what stage they are now, Mm -hmm. whether they've reconciled. And now more people have come forward. Mm -hmm. At one point, I was kind of hopeful that the situation might kind of stabilize. Mm-hmm. And he might not necessarily continue in terms of like people just distancing themselves mm-hmm. and not messing with him. But it doesn't appear that that's the case. Once you lose these opportunities, mm-hmm. they don't ever come back. The only person who had some level of climb back in their career after they lost like those endorsements, those deals, those opportunities, and even then they were still more limited than they were before was Kobe. Kobe mm-hmm. had things happen to him in, Co- in Colorado. Mm-hmm. Everything was like, we're going to keep our distance. And slowly, you know, brands started to mess with him. But he never got McDonald's back. Mm-hmm. He never got, you know, certain 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 companies never messed with him again. Right. Well, I think the whole situation is, is sad. Um, there's clearly a lot of gray area around what actually happened. Apparently, yeah. there's like a video that kind of shows that it's not what it's said to be. Um, here's what I find interesting. This this is when on the edit, right, you pop up, um, Dr. Umar, where, don't you find this suspicious? Yeah. You don't find that suspicious? Aside from Harvey Weinstein, when you have white celebrities, right, if there's some sort of allegation that comes out, sexual abuse, any sort of vile act, right, it's usually just one person, right? And then they go away. Like, they may lose everything. Like, uh, what's the dude from um, House Hello? of Cards? Well, Matt Lowry too, but House of Cards. Um, Kevin Spacey. Kevin Spacey, right? The, the, the whole thing with the boy. Usually it's one thing and like they, they're gone. They lost and whatever. But it always seems suspicious that when it's a black person, like this one random thing that pops out of nowhere, then all of a sudden it's 30 of the exact same thing. Well, that's a part of Me Too culture. But, but I just find it suspicious that the majority of times when you see that, it is with black celebrities. Like if you look at R. Kelly, right? These stories, regardless of when he dealt, he had to face his consequences, those storylines been going for a long time. Yeah. So we kind of knew. Consistently. People knew. But when it happened, but when Bill Cosby. When Bill Cosby, like yeah, nobody heard of anything and then it was like. Everybody came Wait, out. what? 60 something women. 70 women, like what? Nowhere. Yeah. So I just find that suspicious. And I just feel like when it comes to us, they really, they are trying to bury us and bury us for good. Um, because uh, the history of the world shows that nobody survives or bounces back through adversity and tragedy like we do. Yeah. Um, like, I want to see this video. I want to see, I'm not saying that he's innocent or guilty or whatever he did, because I don't know. Right. I just find it suspicious that when it happens to us, there's an immediate pylon. And certain things could be isolated, and then there's certain things that are behavior. Like, sexual abuse, sexually abusive people Tend, this tends to be their MO, mm-hmm. right? So when people, when there's white celebrities that get allegations around sexual abusiveness, I find it odd that it ain't like a bunch of other people that did the same, you know, that could come out. But with black folks, it's always multiple right. people. That is kind of odd. Well, there's the other thing that, you know, kind of emerged during the conversation about 
Donald Trump and um, Stormy Daniels, mm-hmm. which is when you are a person of privilege and you have the, the the resources, that like that catch and kill thing in terms of the stories is a real thing. So very true. Yo, you my man. You want a media conglomerate? You pay her for an exclusive. Get her to sign an exclusive NDA mm-hmm. outside of whatever. Now you can't talk about it. So now it's not that the stories don't exist. It's that I had the ability to stop them 100%. from being hurt. So that's you know that's that's another space. We have to be mindful of the sensitivity mm-hmm. that's associated with domestic abuse in any space um, against any gender and for any reason at all. We also have to be cognizant of the history of race in America and how mm-hmm. that plays a part, which makes this a very sensitive and delicate yes. and almost fragile situation in terms of how we engage it. I will say as a agent of America's court system, mm-hmm. that man is innocent until proven guilty. Yep. And you can believe women and at the same time require proof. Yes. And I think yes. that that's a nuance that a lot of people don't get. Those two things can exist in the same space. I'm not at the point where I am defending him. Right, But I not. am at the point where I'm defending his status as innocent until proven guilty. Unfortunately, we live in a world where actually the consequences or the, the, the judge, the jury within a court of public opinion, sometimes those consequences last longer and could become harsher than being in an actual courtroom, right? Because as you can see, like he's losing, he's losing deals. Like, you know, he's lost deals. He's lost no deals. No right. Gala. And, 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 no, and nothing has been proven <coughs> yet. Nothing. And I would have to do my research. I'm sure that there's a race angle to this as well to see how quickly companies distance themselves from us as opposed to, to other people, to other people, I, I can't say for sure that's something I'll have to look into. Well, I, think I think it's a combination of race, and I also think it's a combination of the severity of the offense. I mean, we are in a in a space where we have really begun to put the type of attention and seriousness and severity on the notion of sexual assault mm-hmm. and domestic abuse that for many years went overlooked mm-hmm. and underappreciated in terms of how we handled it and dealt with it. And so now we're in a space where the pendulum has swung to the exact opposite. And so it's, you know, it's not like if he was, for example, brought up on like tax evasion or, right. yep. you know, a, 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 you know, drunken driving or, you know, something else. In this space, in today's world with how far we've come, mm-hmm. that conversation is a no-brainer. It's a non Yeah, 100%. So yeah. it's not necessarily just about the fact that this is a black man and that this is a white woman, there's also the fact of what you did. Like, if you had scammed her out of money, right? maybe this wouldn't be as much <laughs> of a discussion. But, like, that and domestic abuse? Nah, bro. Yeah. Can't fool what you don't want that smoke from anywhere, even if right now it hasn't been substantiated. My only concern, and, you know, we got to move on after this, is really just the fact that, like, even if it's disproven, chances are those deals is not coming back. George Zimmerman was not convicted for the murder of Trayvon Martin. Right. That's what the court said. Do you believe that George Zimmerman murdered Trayvon Martin? Sure do. All right, then. We're going to keep it moving. We have a very, very special Black Brilliance branded conversation coming up. So stay tuned for our main topic right after this. This is our discussion with the movers and the shakers of the culture, the people who have been legends, the people who have impacted what it is that we do, what it is that we listen to, or how it is that we move. Our guest today needs absolutely no introduction, but I'm still going to give the whole story. So if you watch the Charles Coleman podcast, you already know we have Ace Town Connections. We had Mayor Sylvester Turner on, and if you listen to the conversation, you heard him talk about how plugged in he was. You heard him talk about how he was plugged into the culture, because I asked him about, you know, the image of his city. I talked to him about the culture of his city. And of course, he talked about who he was connected to. One of the names he dropped was one of my favorite MCs. He was on my wish list to have on the podcast. And so I said, I need you to connect me with Bun. A couple weeks later, Mayor Turner kept his word. He's hanging out. He sends me a text. He's like, yo, I'm with Bun right now. Bun says, I'm coming to New York because I got a show to do. I said, I would love to have you on my show. And here we have the legendary underground king, Mr. Trill himself, Chef Trill Burger himself, the OG of OGs, 
Bun B is in the building, ladies and gentlemen. Give him a huge round of applause. Super happy to have you, bro. Happy to be here, bro. Super great. happy to have you. Real talk. Thank you so much for coming through, man. And, and let me just say before we start um, that our mayor is connected. All right. In I'm the right. city. You know, um, I know New York has, uh, New York City has a very cool mayor. He outside. I don't know. He's outside. He's outside. He's definitely yeah, outside. Yeah. And so is our mayor, man. Like, there's very few things um, that really represent the city that he's not at. If he's not there, he's probably, like, out of town. So I'm just not in the city. Since we're here, how did that connection even start? I've known him since he was a state representative. He okay. used to be a, a, a U.S. Uh, representative in the Texas House. And so I've known him since then because I'm fairly active in my community, right. as he is too. He's from uh, Fifth Ward, uh, which is a, you know, very well-known um, Black community in Houston. And so, you know, having been signed to Rap Life Records, having had friends in the Fifth right. Ward community, it's always been a very close proximity between myself and Matt Turner. And when he decided to run for mayor, he reached out to me. I gave him my support. And ever since he's been mayor, He's given me support. You know, we were allowed to actually throw a Trill Burgers pop up on the lawn at City Hall to bring the city. I wanted to bring the city out. I wanted to make it a family event and I wanted to do it somewhere that everyone knew where it was. Everyone would feel safe. Um, the mayor and the police department secured the scene, made sure that everything was as it needed to be without being an opposing presence. Yeah. Um, and shout out to, um, our police chief, uh, Troy Fenner, another person who has always extended himself to our community. Very, very often we see tension between police departments and hip hop communities in this country. Um, Houston doesn't exist in that way. Our police chief is black. Um, he's from third ward. He's from the city, homegrown guy. Um, and he, he knows, he understands, he knows he's outside, right? So. In the realest way, though, because he got to protect the city from all kinds of threats. Um, but I just say that to say that Houston is we we different. We different. Yeah, I, I could call them all right. I could call any elected official in my city right now. So let's talk about that because I had actually wanted to get into this later in our conversation, well, but it just happened now. You're in Houston. Yes. You're you know, around a different... So as New Yorkers, gun culture. Yes. All right? So as New Yorkers, in terms of the city, open carry, we don't have none of that. Like, yeah, that's just no, not even... No. It's, like, it's not even a thing, right? No, like, why, how could you? It's too many people on top of each other. And so the, the surroundings and the environment are not conducive to open carry. And I live in Texas. Right. That's a lot to say. That's what I'm saying. So you're... It, right. And so talk to me about that because you're in Texas. You're a black man. You're in Texas. You've had things like Uvalde. You got, you know, Governor Abbott being who he is in terms of just the dichotomy of state government, you know, and that those partisan politics. It's complicated. Well, just so, so how does it shape out for you? Well, just so we're clear from a state aspect, right? Um, we do have a, a governor that is a little bit extra. Right. That's what I'm saying. But but our lieutenant governor, right? That that's a uh, person who could be very toxic to our state and has been, you know what I'm saying? So it's kind of those things where, you know, there was always this notion that if you get rid of Trump, who really does not have any ideology, right? Doesn't really believe anything, right? Is whatever gets him to where he's trying to go, that's what he'll say. Whereas Mike Pence, his entire being is built right. on an ideology, right, right? Right, right? So it's like, if you get rid of Trump, what do you get after that? Well, that's the same thing we deal with in Texas. Uh, if you do get rid, get rid of Greg Abbott, you are likely only to get Dan Patrick and things would only get worse. I had that conversation with a lot of people because I tried to explain to them because Mike Pence had been a governor yes, and because he actually had experience in governance, he understood how to make the machine work in a particular way and was intentional and would be intentional in a way that would be equally as dangerous, if not more dangerous than 45. And a lot of people, so they didn't understand that. Well, I think the, the issue with 45 was, was who's pulling the straight. Right. Right. That was the real thing. Like, where is he taking his cues from? You know what I'm saying? And if it's Breitbart, then it's problematic. Absolutely. Off top, right? I, that's off top. You know, uh, Mike Pence takes his cues 
from hundreds, if not thousands of years of religious ignorance. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Inequality, sexism, racism, classism, you name it. All of that exists within Mike Pence's uh, God system. If that makes any sense. No, it makes, it makes total sense to me. It, it, it kind of like, it's, it's wild because I had notes that I had done on what I wanted to have a conversation. We're like doing it in reverse, which is cool. And we'll get that. I'm sure we'll get it. Yeah, yeah, we'll get it. So I, I was asking about the gun thing because- Oh yeah, so yeah, this double- I was asking about the gun thing because as black people, a lot of our framing around the conversation about responsible firearm ownership or just gun ownership in general is really dictated by what our socialization is. So in New York City, our conversation about gun ownership really is framed around urban violence. Okay. In other places, other regions across the country, if you're socialized with guns in the home for hunting or just for protection or what have you, it's a different take. And so I always find it interesting when I talk to people who didn't grow up in New York or didn't grow up in D.C. or other places or Chicago and other places where like gun laws are extremely restrictive, what their take is. Because... A lot of us associate that with violence, and right. I try to get them. I try to get them out of that mindset, but it's difficult. So for us in Texas, as a Texan, in regard to guns and gun law, the only issue with the gun comes up if you're already a felon, or if you ride with weed. Like that's the problem. You can have the gun, you cannot have the gun and the drug. Mm. That's the that's the big problem. So when you get to our communities, that's where. So it's technically, you're not riding dirty. And yeah. since you got one or the other. Right, right, yeah. right. If you if you got if you got weed in the car, that's it. That well, and that's not even an issue anymore, right? So you could legally possess up to I want to say four ounces of marijuana um in, in Houston. And even if you're arrested for the possession, the DA will decline to prosecute. Yeah. Um the only issue with that is if you cross county lines. So let's say, for example, the majority of Houston exists in Harris County. I live in Brazoria County. So if I come into Harris County and I get pulled over with my gun, that's cool. But if I get caught with my weed, it's going to be like, I got to damn near say, I just bought this. Weed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just, I just, just got this. This guy no up me. I didn't bring it from home. Right, right, right. You know what I'm saying? So there's nuances. But as far as the gun is concerned, the gun in Texas is just a part of life. It's an accessory at this point. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I mean, we don't. Look, there are many people who are not comfortable with guns. Let's let's be very clear. There are a lot of people who are not comfortable with guns. But if you're in Houston, if you're a person of influence, if you are um, a person of means, you know what I'm saying? A gun is just a necessary addition to your lifestyle. You know what I'm saying? I had someone come into my home. I was going to ask you, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, I I never would have wanted to shoot a black man. Let's just be very clear. That's something that I would never want on my conscience and it still pays me to do that. But when you enter my home, then your color, your race, your religion, your gender, all of that shit goes out the window. Facts. When you come in against mine. Um, and that's, that's for me being my thing. Like I've had other it's, it's, it's situations where I've had to deal with conflict with black men before and I've never instigated one of these things. That's always been the issue. My gun has always been uh, primarily for defense. I appreciate that in particular about what you just said, because one of the things that I've always respected about you, about Pep, about how y'all move, and about how you still move, y'all was never, ever on some sucker shit. Never. No. Y'all was never on some suckers. We, and, but, but here's the thing. But even as y'all was never on some sucker shit, it was very clear, don't try it. Well, for us, it was always about trying to make sure that this microcosm that we existed in wasn't also a bubble. You know what I'm saying? So, staying very true to our ideals, you know what I'm saying, our codes of honor, right, without being too country, too, yeah, you know what I'm saying, too Southern, right? Like, yes, I have my Southern pride. I love where I'm from. I, I, I enjoy representing it. But I should make sure that these things don't box me out of other opportunities. Did you ever, or have you ever looked at 
the game, especially, I mean, you've been around, you've been in this since 92. You know what I'm saying? Like, you've been in this yes. since 92. Right? Professionally. Professionally, right? But, you know, been in this since 92. So you've seen a lot. Have you ever looked at the, the, the trends that come and go where people have decided to jump on that and they sort of extra Southern it up or they extra sort of like gimmick it up or wherever they're from, or whatever it is they do. And have you ever, has, have you ever been tempted? Cause like I said, y'all never did that. Y'all never. Yeah, no, 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 no. Because what we represented was never really about, look, we wanted to make money and we were going to make money, yeah. right? If the records didn't pay off, which they didn't for many years, we found other ways to make money. Right. So there was never a need to clown ourselves right. in order to do that. Um, but I don't knock anyone on the decisions they make because they're the ones that have to live with themselves. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And that's why there were many opportunities where um, we could have, we could have gotten more exposure, right? But at the cost of something, right? At the cost of compromise. So that's why if you notice, there are not a lot of UGK music videos. Like, yeah, that's, that's very and so, and that's because the budgets were minuscule. They never wanted to really give us. And like I in, in my mind, UGK's first real music video is players at, is international players. At. That's the first time we had like a legitimate budget. Um, we had a respectable director. And I'm not saying I haven't been on video sets. Of course. Was right, obviously, you know. But no, this was the first time with like, you know, this is what we want to do. This is the vision. And I'll be very honest. A lot of that had to do with the fact that our cast was on the record. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They were more willing to do these things. Just the idea of our cast even being on a record at that time was a huge deal. Um, and so, yeah, no, we, we would prefer to just be who we were in the space that we were in and figure it out from there then have to present ourselves as a Southern version of something, you know what I'm saying? Or to the point where it's almost like creating a caricature of what a Southern rapper is, as opposed to just being a Southern rapper, right? We could, right. could have been gimmicks that could have been applied in order to further the movement, but then the movement still in my mind, would never have gotten as far as it did because it would not have been genuine. Right. Can you think of a time where, like, you were faced with that specifically? Oh, absolutely. After Big Pimpin', you know, the record company called us and we were working on the follow-up album to ride Dirty, Dirty Muddy. Yep. And the record company's like, so let's, you know, let's do this Big Pimpin' too. Because remember, Big Pimpin', which was the biggest record in the world that year, it was still a Jay-Z record. So the record company was like, let's do it. Let's get another beat from Timbaland. Let's get a verse from Jay. Let's get hyped to do the video. Like they're ready to commit to like two and a half million, at least. Will Smith blocked us all at once. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I was like, okay, but if we don't get a Timberland and we don't get a Jay-Z verse, can we still get a Hype Williams video? Yeah. Right? Can we still go overseas and shoot something? Like, can we still get this superstar treatment? And of course, negotiations have nuances. So it was never no. It was like, <laughs> it was like, why wouldn't you? Mm. Right? Why wouldn't you want to rap on a Timbaland beat with Jay-Z and have Hype Williams direct the video? And we were like, simply because that's not us. We didn't make the decision to rap to a Timbaland beat. We were asked to rap to a Timbaland beat. Jay-Z picked a Timbaland beat. We were asked uh, by Hype Williams if he could do our video. Jay-Z picked I Williams, we just got the residual benefits of being along for the ride. Now, I know you, you've told the story before about how it was kind of, you know, sketchy in terms of getting Pep to do the video. Oh, it was, it was a, it was a deal breaker. Like just the idea of him being on the song, it was a deal breaker because perception, and I always say, if you watch any other interviews and talk to me personally, I always talk about perception and proximity, right? Perception is very key in this world. And Pimp, Pimp's reservations about not doing the song were because of the fact that the beat, if you look at the beat just from the beginning, the, the beat for, for Big Pimpin, and never, something like that had never been done before, really hasn't been done again. It's, right. it's a very, very unique musical creation. 
the way it bounces. Yeah, just yeah, just what which where it's drawing from. But you know what I'm saying? Um, not necessarily the same cultural cues that we normally have when we enter into creations uh, from hip hop. But then on top of that, you got Jay Z, who at the time's biggest rapper in, in the world, um, has a lot of momentum with him. And Pip was just like, man, people that don't know us are going to think this is who we are. Yeah. They're going to think this is a part of our sound. Because you got to think, this wasn't jay Z set at the time. This was very different from what Jay-Z was doing. Yeah, and as it, was, it was definitely a departure. Yes. And that's part of why it worked. Well, yeah, but I, but Pimp was like, you know, I was like, this is going to be a great opportunity. But Pimp's going to be like, what if they think this is our sound? What if they think this is our vibe? And then they come looking for us and that ain't what they find. You know what I'm saying? Like they should know exactly who we are when they see us. And that's why when he did agree to do the record and he was like, okay, I don't rap on it. I'm only going to do eight ball. <laughs> right? right. And I don't care what nobody's doing or talk about. I'm going to do me on this. So nobody get me twisted. Yeah. You know, he did have, you know what I'm saying? He and did that's the most memorable part of the song. It really is though. And, and that goes back to being genuine and authentic. Right, you cannot be your own perception of who you should be. You should just be, right? Because if you're not just being, then you have to rely on recall every conversation and every interaction. Right? What did I say? How did I stand? You know, what was you know what was my demeanor? Right? What was my vibe in that room? You have to constantly recall that type of stuff, and it's so hard to have to draw from the subconscious, like on cue. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned, and I, you know, this was something that I just thought about. You talked about international play anthem being a huge, you know, a huge record because our counts. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong, we made our contribution. Of course, no, no, no. and I'm, I'm, I'm coming to that, right? Like, y'all got off, not as, as would be expected, of course. Yes. One thing I know about you is you take a lot of pride in your pain. You take pride in your craft, and you should, and. <clears throat> you're an MC who is secure in who you are as an MC and you know what you can do with the English language. Absolutely. As you should. So you're on a verse, or you're on a record with Andre 3000, who is considered by a lot of people to be upper echelon that guy. You are upper, less, up, up, upper echelon that guy MC. Was that any motivation to have your pin game even stronger? Or would you just, you know, do you think about that when you're on the record, whether it's Talib, whether it's Jay? Does that ever make you up your game? Or are you just kind of like, I'm just doing me regardless, period. I'm showing up as... Well, well yeah, that, uh, in almost every other scenario, yes, that would be the case. But the, there's a different angle with International Players Anthem. So International Players Anthem was originally recorded with 3-6 Mafia. It's produced by 3-6 it is. And so the original version was UGK and Three Six Mafia. It was part of a, a group that we had formed called U Underground Mafia. So we were about to collaborate at creating a super group. Living crazy. You know what I'm saying? So um, Pim comes home from prison. And one of the albums that he was listening to significantly was the Project Pat Soul. And one of the songs Pat had was a song called I Cheese You. Of course. Which is the exact beat that For rap is. And it was like, that's a hit record. You know, y'all need to read, y'all need to drop it again. Y'all need to run again. If I could not drop it that record again, Pat's already making music. And so Fred was like, give me the beat, give, give me the song, you know? And so they, you know, they were like, we could produce you any kind of beat. Like, no, that's a hit record. That's, that's a beat. So we record, we record it. We get three, six mafia on the record, three, six mafia. Then in a few months go on to win the Oscar for a best song for yep. uh, hard on hit for a Yep. yep. Right. Um, as with everything else, typically when you win an Oscar, your rates go up. So they assumed the same as well and went in to renegotiate your deal. Sony didn't feel that way about it. So they ended up shelving them as a recording group. So they would not clear three, six mafia as rappers on the salt at the time. Wow. Um, but the song still went out as a sampler. Um, or an album sample, which I don't know if you're under 35, you probably wouldn't know what this is. <laughs> um, artists used to create a sampler of their albums, take like a 20, 30 second snippet of four or five hot songs and just give that away to people to get some building a buzz. You know, 
social media. So our our sampler um, was released All Star Weekend. So obviously the promo team went hard in L.A. Big Boy and Andre both get the sampler separately. Big Boy contacts me. Hey, man, I love this song. Are y'all done with the album? I want to get on the song. No, we love to have you on the song. Okay, but I just want to rap to the drums. I don't want to rap to the sound. I want to rap to the drums. Andre calls separately. No idea that Big Boy's called. Hey, man, I love this record. I really want to rap to it. <laughs> and I just rap to the sound. I don't want to rap to it. Wow. So that that in itself, right, told me a lot about their process. Their, their process, right? And um, so, and if you listen to the record, Andre obviously raps over the sample. And when Big Boy comes in, it's only drums. Now, we ended up adding music later, but a majority of his verse is rapping yeah. over the drums. And, um, and so my verse was already done when Andre got on the record. So there was no anticipation. But UGK and Outkast have recorded before. Right. On the Shaft soundtrack, a uh, song called Tough Guy. I remember that song. And I had to record that in stake only. So yeah, so to to answer your initial question, um, but for a different song, absolutely. <laughs> and in consideration, it is not lost upon me how easy it is for Andre to do what he does from a, a lyrical standpoint, which is why he doesn't do it more often. Yeah. Because he would almost be, at this point, he would almost be phoning it in, mm -hmm. right? Because he's just really so good at it that it doesn't necessarily present a challenge. Mm. Wow. But that's why people like Andre go off and learn the flute. People like Daniel Day Lewis go off and learn how to be a shoe cobbler, right? Bumby goes off and does hamburgers, you know? Which, which leads me directly to my next thing. I am a hamburger connoisseur. Like, I love burgers. Three out every, one out of every three people tell me this. I, I, I'm sure they do. It is the exact quote. I am a hamburger. I'm not a hamburger fiend. I'm not a lover. I am connoisseur. a connoisseur. So I go places. I go to cities. I want the best burger. I'm so, if I got to fly to Houston to get a trail burger, I am going. Because after, so I saw the Tyler video. Yes. Where Tyler did the, and first of all, I mean, I, I appreciated the fact that you let people have the burgers the way that they want. Like, not, you know what I'm saying? He was like, not a pickle person. That's cool. So I actually like pickles and onions. Yes. All burgers. So I'm good. I just don't like cheese. That's my thing. Well, I think I don't like onions or pickles either, right? Okay. I have a natural aversion to onions just based on texture. Um, but I ask everyone to try it. As is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I you know get it. Saying? But some people just, just know. If I have to eat it with that, I'm not going to eat it. So talk to me about the drill burger. First of all, what was your what was your response? I'm not Tyler, so I, you know, I I I have my own way that I want to try it. Yeah. I want to try it as is. Um, talk to me about how you got into that space, where it came from, and because you've always done other stuff. You yeah. oh, you know, whether it's the coloring book, an activity book, whether it's teaching, you know, as a professor at right, you've always done other stuff. But now you're doing troll burger. So talk to me about like how that even got moved. But this is all these things you're talking about. This is all about being open to collaboration. Mm -hmm. Right. So um a, a friend of mine approached me. I'd known him um previously through the clothing industry. He had a brand called I Am King. Um, and then transitioned into the food industry and became very successful in the food industry. Um, and had recently bought into a brand in Houston that I was a big fan of. I love their food. And um, he was looking at trends. He's very good at like trying to catch food trends and whatnot. And so he saw the smash burger trend getting a lot of traction in LA and was slowly starting to be beast as all trends do. Yeah. It used to be the poke bowl, right? All of a sudden poke right. bowls is everywhere. Um, last year was hot chicken. Yep. You know what I'm saying? They start saying hot chicken, chicken places, lots of pop up everywhere. Right mm -hmm. now it's smash burger, right? And so in his mind, um, the trend had gotten all the way to Oklahoma. And so he was like, if I don't catch this trend by Texas, it's, I'm gonna miss it. it's gone. Right. They put a lot of research into the creation of the burger and were really excited about their opportunity. And so a, good, a mutual friend of ours, Nick Skirfield, said, hey, um, you know, Bun's been looking to do some stuff with food for a while. 
maybe you should contact him. So he set up a meeting between us. I, uh, I tried the burger and the rest, as they say, is history. Did they have, did they have the trill sauce on when you tried? Absolutely. The burger was probably 92% of what it is now. It was really good. But when we did a little bit more R and D, they tweaked it a little bit and they brought it back. And not only it was already the first time I ate it, the best burger I'd ever had. Mm. But when I ate it the second time, it was one of the best dining experiences I'd ever had. Mm. Because this burger is calculated. I like that. This burger is calculated. This is not somebody in the backyard cooking a burger whose brother-in-law and cousins kept telling him, you should do something with it. <laughs> no, no, no. This was created by a Cora Blue train ship. Oh, all right. Who wanted to create um, a handheld umami experience, do burgers, mm -hmm. um, and did it. He really actually created um, a hamburger that has the salty, the sour, the savory, the bitter. It has all these different taste elements that when you combine them, create what the Japanese refer to as umami. What black people would be like when you eat really good mac and cheese. You know what I'm saying? I love it. That feel. I love it. I'm, I'm coming to your town. I need a troll burger, extra sauce. I love to bring it to your town. I I, I, there was, that was my question is, what's the play around expansion? Because if I can get away here, I'm even happy. Honestly, um, slowly but surely, right? Um, I, I do plan on at some point having a troll burger establishment and every major metropolitan city and concasably around in the smallest suburban areas. Um, but scale is a very tricky thing, scaling up a brand. And to be honest, this is a cultural brand. It's built on the culture of Trill, which is a Texas term that was eventually um, accepted nationwide and worldwide. Um, but again, when I talk about proximity, right, let's say that you know, Houston is the heartbeat, right? Or Houston is where the, the radar is telling you it's emanating from, right? And so that's where it's the strongest. Okay. And so as we expand, mm -hmm. it doesn't resonate everywhere as it does at that original point. So for us as a brand, we're looking to maximize Texas as much as possible. Makes sense. From a brick and mortar aspect, you know, I have Dallas, I have Austin. How many Texas stores do you have now? How many... Well, right now we only have one brick and mortar that by the time this podcast releases should be open, but we're also in the soccer stadium, Shell Energy. We're in the NFL stadium, uh, Reliant, NRG. Uh, and we are also in moving into the basketball stadium, Toyota Center. 